Hi, fashionistas. Welcome to the first lecture series on vintage Roxy doll, where we will focus on the establishment of American fashion. This is part one of three in the series, Yes, We Can, American Fashion During World War II and Beyond. At the onset of World War II, American women lost access to European couture fashion, particularly during the Nazi occupation of Paris. Many iconic designers closed their doors, including Madame Gris and Balenciaga, while others like Mainbancher, Malneu, and Scaparelli fled to London, New York, and Hollywood. This provided a unique opportunity for budding American designers to enjoy the spotlight of fashion in their own country. Milliner Lily Deshay became a mainstream designer while Edith Head dispensed fashion advice for her stars as well as the American public. For the first time, American designers' names could be found on the tags of clothing they created. Claire McArdle throughout World War II used inventive designs to problem solve for the needs of American women. She with other designers like Tina Lesner, Pauline Trigere, and Norman Norrell rose to the occasion to define the look of American fashion, including clean lines, making comfort a priority, but most importantly, addressing the needs of the American woman. The next generation of American designers including Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, and Donna Karen, would continue this tradition. For many of these American designers, they learned practicality above all else due to the restrictions placed on goods during World War II to prioritize resources for the war effort. American manufacturers and fashion editors had no choice but to focus on the talent at home, thus starting the golden era of American fashion design. Many of these designers started their companies while following wartime rationing restrictions. This lecture series will focus on the following designers in three parts. Previous to World War II, American designers were regulated to copying designs of European designers. Many worked for companies that sent them to Parisian fashion shows to spy on the next trends in fashion. Dorothy Shaver, vice president of Lord & Taylor, was the first retailer to feature original designs, including the names of these American designers, in advertising campaigns for the first time in 1932 as part of the American Look program. Lily Deshay was a Viennese-born, Parisian-trained milliner who opened her first studio in New York City in 1926. Her business grew into a seven-story building where her famous clients included Wallace Simpson and actress Lauren Bacall. During the war years, she elevated hats to become an essential and focal part of daywear. By focusing on hats as a focal point, women often wore rationed approved suits and dresses with more frequency using hats as a way to maintain a fashion forward look throughout World War II. Before Halston created his famous pillbox hat, he worked for Dache in 1958 before moving on to Bergdorf Goodman in 1959, where he would create Jackie Kennedy's famous headwear. Claire McArdle is credited as the inventor of the American look, which focused on the more casual American lifestyle following the end of World War II. Sally Kirkland, fashion editor at Vogue, called McArdle, quote, the most innovative, independent, and ingenious of American designers, end quote.
Claire McArdle's talent lie in understanding the needs of American women, both during and after World War II. Later, another American designer, Donna Karen, would exclaim, I design what I feel is missing from my closet, with great success as her needs met with those of the 1980s working woman. McArdle established this philosophy, creating clothing for sports, travel, and city country commuting as a suburban businesswoman with a full social calendar after World War II. McArdle, born in Frederick, Maryland, attended Parsons School of Design and later landed a job at Townley Frocks as the assistant to Robert Turk. When Turk died suddenly of a sailing accident, McArdle worked as their head designer until they closed in 1938. She created a dress that would establish her as worthy of being one of the first designers to have their name featured on the tag of their clothing in the United States. At 33 years old, McArdle found success with one of her first groundbreaking designs, the Monastic in 1938. This design could easily be converted back and forth from maternity to day wear with the rise in pregnancies throughout the baby boom years. Throughout World War II, she thrived within the parameters of fabric restrictions and designed women's clothing that easily was mass produced. The former owners of Townley Frocks were able to reestablish the company in 1940, with McArdle as their head designer once again. McArdle designed clean-lined, comfortable clothing that pr proved it was not necessary to sacrifice comfort to be fashionable. Stanley Marcus of Neiman Marcus Dean McArdle, the master of the line. As she was known for her self tailoring wrap and tie styles, including swimsuits, backless halters, and shirt dresses cut from men's shirting fabrics. McArdle's models were fresh and natural, often resembling actress Lauren Bacall with an ease that made both her casual designs just as comfortable as her cocktail dresses. McArdle's designs were youthful and founded in logic, informed by common sense and comfort. At the end of World War II, soldiers returned home to start families and take advantage of the benefits of their military service, including assistance with home ownership. As a result, the American suburbs grew at a breakneck pace and the suburban lifestyle was widely adopted. McArdle's designs included the perfect outfit for a day at the beach or a picnic, as well as easy to wear and wash cocktail dresses and ensembles. McArdle ennobled humble fabrics like cotton calico, denim, and Jersey by way of thoughtful design and her addition of McArdleisms, including asymmetrical hems, wrap necklines, spaghetti string ties, top stitching, and pockets. Her clothing became staples in the wardrobes of college girls, working women, and housewives alike. McArdle's collections included capsule dressing in which four or five pieces mix and match to create a wide variety of outfits made of wool jersey, cotton, and denim. This easy travel wardrobe could be purchased all together for about $100 and would easily fit into a weekend travel bag. The cocktail dress popularized following the end of World War II, became an integral part of the American woman's wardrobe. As soldiers returned home and many completed college, married and started families, the suburban lifestyle flourished. The lines between business and pleasure blurred as executives would entertain potential clients after work during the cocktail hour, and wives or girlfriends were expected to be on hand. 
McArdle created practical yet slightly elegant dresses out of the traditional fabrics, including silk. However, McArdle understood that after a whirlwind of events, women might need a few cocktail dresses in her wardrobe that she could throw in the washing machine. So her collections included evening gowns made of cotton velvet, chintz cotton, and seersucker. Thank you for joining me for the first segment of Yes We Can. I hope you will join me for the second part, post-war American fashion featuring Tina Lesner, Edith Head, and Norman Morell. <laughs> 